Christmas questions, the questions we get at Christmas. One of those questions that sometimes isn't asked, but is in the heart of every child is, what is my present? What's in that thing wrapped up? And as I'll speak about today, we have a gift as well. Our gift is Jesus. But what exactly is that gift? What does he give to us in this Christmas and for our whole life? Well, I think if you pay attention, you'll learn some ways in which you are gifted uh, from God and ways in which God wants to bless you. Merry Christmas to you, and I look forward to seeing you when you come join us here at First Presbyterian Church. Wow, what a great service we've had already. Isn't this just wonderful? Absolutely. <laughs> I think, I don't know, I think you in the back couldn't really hear it as they were, the wonderful Biggs family was up here lighting the candle. As soon as Andrew turns on that flame, Tom, little Thomas goes, I think this is the part where I back away. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Such a sweet kid. This series is called Christmas Questions, and I am taking the questions that arise in this season and trying to look at them from, in a new light. Last week, we explored how can I be merry, and several of you came up to me with tears in your eyes and said, thanks so much for speaking my truth in this season. And I just pray that the Lord is able to deal with each of us when we not only have the celebration of this season, but also the waves of grief that come up on some of us. This week, the question is, what is my present? Kids see packages wrapped under the trees, and they wonder if the thing that they have wanted, they've seen advertised over and over on television, if that is really the thing that's under that tree. Did mom and dad buy just the right thing? We don't have little ones right now, but Cindy and I, like many of you, bought for um, the kids from the angel tree. And so we have this, we got a tag, he's a 15-year-old boy, and his father is in jail and he wanted an Xbox game and so we go and look through the Xbox games and it's difficult what what game does a 15 year old boy want but you know given the circumstances I saw that Grand Theft Auto I thought I don't think that's the right (laughs) thing we got the I, I would say the obliquely spiritual game called Destiny and that maybe will be fine for him I hope so some joke that Christmas is kind of a strange season That is, we go crazy buying all these presents in the name of perhaps the most non-materialistic person who ever lived. And it's true, sometimes we are all about the gifts and not about the true reason for the season. But it, it is also true that the entire coming of Jesus is God's gift to us. And as we give gifts, whether they're ugly sweaters or whatever, As we give these gifts, the idea is this is a reminder. It's a reminder of God's gift to us. And so here's a little gift to you. So the question today is, well, what is the gift that God has given to us? What is our present in Christ? And there are lots of ways to speak about the gift we have received in Christ. The Bible calls him the bright and morning star, the rose of Sharon, the lamb of God, the author and finisher of our faith, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life. And I could go on and on. But this week, I thought I would turn to Isaiah's famous words. Because while he is there in this war-torn world, he sees the coming of one who will change the world forever. And he summarizes who and what this present is for us in four titles from Isaiah chapter 9. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal 
of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. May we pray. God, as your zeal has accomplished so much in the coming of Christ, may that same zeal do its work in our hearts today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah lived in a time when Israel had known defeat after defeat. All they saw around them was that the temple had been abandoned, their fields were owned by others, and they were reduced to slavery. But Isaiah is not limited to his present circumstances. He looks into a future that is gloriously different. This chapter begins with those famous words, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And in the future, Isaiah says, God will honor Galilee of the nations. And for 700 years, people wondered, what great can come out of Galilee? Then we come to our text for today. He begins by saying that the ways of wars, the garments that are rolled in blood, that it will go away. There, they, it will be fuel for the fire. There is going to be a new approach. There is a new leader. Someone will emerge who will take the government upon his shoulder. This person will be known by four characteristics revealed in four titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This then is our present. This is the gift that we have been given. And I thought that we would unpack it this morning and see if we can't put it together. First, wonderful counselor. Today we understand counselors to be men and women who listen to us and help us understand our motivations. They help us identify patterns that are destructive. Ray Rice was interviewed this week after all the publicity and his, the video of his terrible attack on his wife. He said he went to counseling, and he said the counselor, he took me apart, and then he put me back together again. The counselor leads us into deeper truths about ourselves that we might have avoided. And Jesus is that kind of counselor. The Bible says that Jesus knew the hearts of men. He can help us change from being conformed to the patterns of this world to being transformed by the renewal of our mind. But this is not the kind of counselor that Isaiah had in mind. Another meaning of the word counselor is attorney. In every law and order, you have a judge saying, would counsel please approach the bench? Jesus did say that hey, we did not need to fear if we were dragged before the courts because the Holy Spirit, the counselor, will give us words to say. But this also is not what Isaiah means by counselor here. In Isaiah's usage, the meaning of counselor was an advisor. In particular, he was an advisor to the king or some other powerful figure. They earned that role demonstrating wisdom, having distinguished themselves in difficult leadership decisions, and finding their way carefully through personal clashes. They see the bigger picture, and they do not flinch in the face of conflict. I had the chance to be in this role for a number of years when I was at Gig Harbor. The head of staff, Mark, and I would work through dozens of tough situations as the, turf, as the church grew. We had staff problems, we had elder problems, we had budget problems, I mean, you name it. And my role was to be a listener, to weigh in at the right time, to challenge him when we were in private, if I thought he was wrong, and to always be a support outside of our meeting. Several of you are that to me. You take me to lunch or or make yourself available to me in some way, and you're willing to listen, and you offer your input if asked. And I am so grateful for the counsel I have received from you. Our text today says that Jesus is that kind of counselor. And he's not just your regular counselor in that role. He is a wonderful counselor. Here is how the Lord describes his counsel. My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purposes. Some advisors might try to hedge their bets. Jesus says he will play it straight. He promises to send his counselor spirit to us. And he says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. It is good and it is wise to take counsel. 
Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. We need advisors. But we should always remember that our great counsel, our wonderful counselor, is still Jesus Christ. And I wonder if you've taken his counsel. Have you turned to him as you face that challenging decision that you are making right now? Have you come to him and asked, Lord, what do you think? Have you waited there in silence? And have you agreed to be open to his guidance over these next several weeks? Maybe the situation you are facing this holiday season has really confused you. You know exactly what you want to do, but is that what you should do? What counsel would the Lord give you? What example from Jesus' life do you take to heart in this circumstance? I encourage you to let him be your wonderful counselor today. He's also a mighty God. Jesus said, I, am the, I and the Father are one. I mean, we understand Jesus is God, but the point here at issue here is whether he is effective because he could be a weak God. He could, we could turn to him and nothing really might happen. But he is the God who parts the Red Sea and he is the God who heals hearts. This is what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. He has incomparably great power. He is a mighty God. And so when you wonder if God has it under control, if he is in charge, if he is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we could ever ask or think, when things seem to be close to failure, remember this second gift wrapped up and waiting for you to open under the tree of his love that he is a mighty God. Are you trusting today that ours is a mighty God? But our God does not limit his relationship with us to one of power. He is also a tender God. He is the God who is near. He ca to capture this, this gift to us, he has this third title, Everlasting Father. I've been to a couple of memorials here now. And often we'll have a slide show of the deceased. And one of the songs that's happened a couple times is, Tell Me About the Good Old Days. And here's the lyric that strikes me. Did lovers really fall in love to stay? Stand beside each other, come what may? Was a promise really something people kept, not just something they would say? Did families really bow their heads to pray? Did daddies really never go away? Grandpa, tell me about the good old days. One of the truths of fathers in our day is that too often they are anything but everlasting. But Jesus comes as one you can count on, as the one who promises that he will never leave you. That's what we read in 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He is the everlasting father. Later on, as we continue to go through Luke, we'll read the prodigal son, but people have said, some scholars have said, you know, that, that parable is misnamed. It shouldn't be called the prodigal son. It should be called the running father. Because even when we are far from him, he is waiting and he is ready to come to us if we will but turn around. As a dad, I'm actually trying to be that kind of father right now. We have a son, Andrew, who's Andrew and, and uh, Blue and Liam were going to come out to visit us. And his idea was that they were a little family, although not married. And Blue's idea is a little different than that. And she said, you know, I, we're not together, and so I think it's best if, if I don't come. And so there is Andrew upset, and he, we thought, well, maybe they just Andrew and Leon can come, except we have been getting no communication from him. He won't answer his phone. He hasn't texted or emailed. He has gone radio silent. And, of course, Dad has bought the plane tickets, but that's a minor detail. 
And the truth is, I have some opinions about how this might impact his mother, how much we have done for him. Oh, I could go on and on with things that I could share with you all. But I know that when this silence is broken, that I have to be careful how I speak. And by the way, if you're worried that he might be listening to this sermon by, you know, on his computer, don't worry about that. I don't think he follows me too closely. I want to be careful to not blast him. I want to accept him back. I want to be like that everlasting father. I'm still here when he turns back to us. And I wonder if you know Jesus as that kind of presence, as that everlasting father. This church gets a little bit more full at Christmas season. I know some folks who came back haven't been away for a long time. And maybe they don't They feel a little bit like that prodigal son walking back in with the walls crack. What's going to happen here? Some folks said we've been away too long. If you are just returning, welcome. It is so good to have you back. And it may be that that's just an illustration of how you've gone yourself radio silent with God. He has been hoping to receive you to his heart, but you haven't spoken to him in a long time. And I would say the Christmas season is a good time to break the silence. And here you are. Listen to me. God doesn't want to blast you. He wants to accept you back. Let today be the day that you allow him once again to be that everlasting father to you. And finally, there is this fourth and wonderful title, Prince of Peace. And as Don pointed out, this being December 7th, I'm sure many of you thought of the irony that today we light the candle of peace. For some of you, December 7th doesn't really ring a bell. But for others of you, it is as if you were there again or you know what that date meant to your parents every time it rolled around. 73 years ago, December 7th was the day our nation's sense of security was shattered. 353 Japanese fighter planes in two waves made their unprovoked attack on Pearl Harbor. 188 U.S. aircraft were destroyed. 2,403 Americans were killed. And 1,178 others were wounded. And of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt famously proclaimed December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. December 7, 1941, reminds us now of of September 11, 2001. And since that December, and since that September, there have been wars again and again and again. Wars and strife are in the headlines every day. And it's not just international conflicts. There is tension in our everyday life. There is no peace, for example, in the wake of the grand jury's failure to indict in New York. And on and on it goes. And we wonder if Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Where is that peace? But Jesus himself said that there would be, there would forever be wars and rumors of wars. He certainly got that one right, didn't he? But he also said that in this world we will have trouble. But then he puts on a jaunty face and he says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And how has he done that? And how can we do that? Give us this gift, Lord, and we will be forever grateful. Will you recall his words on the night in which he was arrested? The very night in which he inaugurated the Lord's Supper that we're about to participate in. When he was surrounded by a hostile military. When he was about to be taken down to the police station and be beaten. And he would later be spiked to a tree in the center of all that controversy and tension and warfare. These were his words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not. And do not be afraid. If you, if you are going through trouble, have you thought about letting his peace be your peace? Have you thought of saying, Lord, take this and let me entrust it to you because I have done all the worrying and all the crying I can do. I just need to rest in you. 
Turn to Jesus and let him give you his peace. This Christmas, we have a gift. We have a wonderful counselor. We serve a mighty God. We have an everlasting father. And we come this morning to receive from the one who offers us a different kind of peace than the UN can give or war can produce. He offers us his peace in this rough and tumble world of ours. And if you would ask, what is my present? There it is. It is wrapped up in four packages. It comes in four parts. Some assembly is required. But he has done the shopping, and now it is for us to open our gift. So we shall do so. And on that night on which Jesus was arrested, after he had given thanks, he took the bread. And he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so remembering me. The Apostle Paul goes on to say, now whenever we eat this bread or drink from this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. And I, ministering his name, offer you this bread and this cup that they might be for you the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so bring nourishment to your soul. May we pray. Lord, thank you for the Christmas gifts, for the ways in which you have loved us, and love us still. And as we receive this reminder of your presence, be that healing presence. Be that presence of peace and power, that presence of love, that presence of hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God, you have taken these elements, everyday elements, the most everyday elements you could find just about certainly in your day, the bread and the wine. And you've set them aside for an uncommon purpose. Now, God, you remind us that we ourselves have been set aside for an uncommon purpose. To live in the light of your Son before others. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, this challenge, this thrill of living that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Holy child, Emmanuel. been given a wonderful gift in the person, in the life, in the work, in the death, and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And know that you have a wonderful counselor. You have a mighty God. You have an everlasting Father. And he is your Prince of Peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said,